Welcome to Ask the Hiring Manager. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode. Today, I am happy to have Paul Wolf as a guest on Ask the Hiring Manager. Paul has more than two decades of HR experience with roles including inaugural Senior VP of Global Human Resources for Indeed, VP of Human Resources at Condé Nast, and Chief HR Officer at Match.com. In addition to his extensive HR background, Paul is a human first leadership advocate, author of Human Beings First, and host of 52 Humans. So great having you here today, Paul. Oh, thanks, Leslie. I appreciate it. I like when when people read that intro and it's like 20 years plus, it makes me feel really old. But <laughs> I'll, I'll try I'll try to try to bring my younger energy to this. Well, you look great. Well, okay, <laughs> so good, good. I appreciate I appreciate you're doing is working. As do you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you were head of human resources at Indeed for a while, and it's quite a big deal. As Indeed is, if I recall correctly, the world's number one job site. And you were the first in the position. So tell me about some of the initiatives you carried out while at Indeed. Uh, in, Indeed's amazing. So the, the mission statement is we help people get jobs or I help people get jobs. So you, five simple words and everybody in the organization truly understands how what they're doing every single day relate back to that mission. And that mission does have some social good to it. Um, world's largest job search engine. When I got there, the company was about nine and a half years old. Uh, we were just under a thousand employees and I left at the beginning of 22. So I was there for about uh, seven and a half, almost eight years. Um, and we were just over 12,000 employees. And so we grew very rapidly for that period of time and revenue grew rapidly as well. And we started with one simple product, paid search, um, mm -hmm. and then ended up with a multitude of recruiting products, many of which you're uh, your watch viewers, either on the corporate side or the job seeker side, I'm sure have interacted with at some point. Um, you know, when I got there, there, there were parts of an HR team. So I think the first year or so was just building foundational kind of muscle and expertise and creating some functions that didn't exist before, like a, a true total rewards function. As you can imagine, there was a recruiting function there. Yeah. And one unique thing that a lot of people don't know is uh, at Indeed, we only use Indeed products to hire with. So we ended up when I ended my my tenure there. My HR team was about 700 people in total, and a good half of that was recruiting. We would over over the seven and a half years I was there, we probably hired somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000 people. Wow, that's a lot. And you said it started at around 12,000. Yeah, a, a bit of a machine, um, but you know, using all of our own products is you want to drink your own champagne and you want to be able to talk to clients about kind of here's how it works and here's what we've asked our product team to lean into. It's also interesting being in HR for an HR company because you have a lot more connection with the product team and how things are being developed um, yeah. because they've got a group of true users in-house. Um, one of the first things I did was uh, we, there, there was a lot of wrangling over the title of it. Um, it's known to most people as unlimited vacation. We called it open PTO because one of our attorneys did not like unlimited vacation. It's fine. <laughs> um, but the premise of it, you, you hear a lot of, there's a lot of chatter about unlimited vacation um, on LinkedIn in general. And I think a lot of people take the view that it's like, oh, it's a company's way to get financial accruals off the books and not have people take vacation. And that wasn't the intent for us. And we kind of went about it a little bit a different way. We did open it up so you could take as much time as you wanted, oh, wow. but it was based on your performance and the, the, the ability of your team to get things done. A manager still had to approve it. And instead of looking at what time people were uh, was were, were taking off, we would start to look at who wasn't taking time and have conversations with their leaders or them about why they weren't taking time and understanding when they were planning time. Because our premise of it was, is we want our employees, like we all know, you know when you're going to hit the proverbial wall. I know when I'm going to hit it. I hit it like Wednesday, right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> I was like, okay, like I need a break. Thank, thank gosh we had four days there. Um, you know when you're when kind of going down that path and who better to judge when you need, need to take time off but you and and if you're performing well and your team can function then your manager makes that decision and allows you the time off we did see you know the first year people getting used to it and there was this trepidation of taking too much time off and then we did see the average number of days per year um per employee go up year over year uh which is a good thing i do think that you know 
Europeans, um, and I'm being sorry, a little bit stereotypical, understand how to take time off and disconnect. Oh, yeah. Amer- well, Americans <laughs> should learn from them. Same thing with mental health conversation. You know, Europeans have been talking about mental health for, for decades publicly and, and with peers and friends. And, and as Americans, we don't do that as well. I think the pandemic has forced some of that, and hopefully we'll start to see some more of that positive change. Um, certainly starting a d- diversity, inclusion and belonging function within the organization was one of the early things that I did so that we could, you know, we had been around for a while. I remember there was a conversation I had with one of our co-founders. We were in Tokyo. Our parent company is, is a Japanese company, uh, their parent company. I keep, I keep saying our every once in a while, their parent <laughs> company is a Japanese company. We were in Tokyo for a group of meetings with them. And, um, I was, we were walking to dinner and, uh, one of our co-founders said, I need to apologize to you. And I like, why? Like you've created this great company. You're around to give us your sage wisdom and advice. This is wonderful. Is like, we should have thought about diversity when we started the company mm. and not waited until we hired a, a head of HR. Um, he's like, and now when I do angel investing with companies, I really make sure they're thinking about diversity, inclusion, and belonging early. And it is it is easier to instill those beliefs and those programs and processes early in a culture when there are fewer people. It gets harder the That's more true. you get. But it's something that, and my comment back to him was like, I appreciate that, but it's something that's never done, un- unfortunately. It's something we always have to keep after and keep looking at and looking at are there systemic issues? Are there behavioral issues? How can we better help? You know, I think for us, it was creating, um, you know, having our employees create their inclusion resource groups. A lot of companies refer to them as employee resource groups or business resource groups. Um, we had nine or 10 to start. There were kind of oh, two wow. that existed before the IPRI, the LGBTQ plus group. And then there was a women in tech group that had existed before we started to formalize it. But then we had a bunch of others, grassroots. And it really, it took us a good two or three years to help those employees understand that these are leadership roles in these in these, in these these groups that's informal leadership, but we're going to look at it as part of your overall career. And then right. ultimately we did start to provide them stipends for the work that they were doing because it was, you know, they were doing, when I left, I, I, I relied on our inclusion resource groups so much for everything. Great insight, great, great just to, you know, when the pandemic started, unfortunately, there was a lot of negative uh, sentiment to Asian Americans or Asians in general. Yeah. And I remember, you know, drafting this note and with our internal communications team. And I'm like, I need to go to our Asian IRG and have them read this because they are the audience. And they came back with these great edits and like, could you add this? Or you don't need to say that. It was just, it's such, it was such a like nice symbiotic relationship that we got to. And it took, it takes a while to get there, but it, it's an amazing thing. And I think the, the other thing I'll highlight is in, and I always screw up the year, um in 2019 because the project started in 2018 but in 2019 we moved to pay transparency um so salary ranges being public internally and externally before it became a legal requirement or kind of like the thing to do in the compensation space and it was a lot of change management there's a lot of um there's a lot of architecture that needs to be built in order to do it effectively uh from a compensation kind of perspective but then there's also the managers that have you know not been overly and i'm not pointing my finger at anybody um managers that have and leaders that haven't been overly transparent with their teams about how they spent their three or four or five percent uh merit pool their their increased pool each year mm-hmm. and you know not being over, overly transparent about how their team stack ranks against each other or how performance really is and so you find that People may say, leaders may say, oh, you're amazing, you're great, but I just have this small pool so I can only give you a two and a half or a 3% increase, which isn't always the case. There is a pool, it's not an unlimited check, but they make the decision because they understand their performance best. And so there was a lot of angst from managers we ultimately uncovered around us being transparent with all of this and people realizing that they were, you know, just below the midpoint of a range versus being on the higher side of that midpoint and things like that. It just becomes so much easier, that compensation conversation and hiring somebody becomes so much easier when there is a range posted. I still don't understand companies, and I see this all the time on LinkedIn and other places, indeed, other places jobs get posted that post a range from like $10,000 to $400,000. Like that is not a range, people. Yeah. Like, and yes, it, there's tough work that goes on, but you need to... It's so much easier when you're transparent about it with a candidate because 
if I'm in that range, that's great. If I'm below that range, that's great. If I'm above that range, I need to think about it. It's also going to clean out some of the people that post for jobs because they may opt out because they understand what the range is and they're making more than that today and they can't take a pay cut. Yes. Um, it's just, I implore employers and, and companies to go transparent, even though you legally don't have to and do it in the right way. I think so that's are, that was a really long answer, but those are three. No, no, no I, I, I love it. <laughs> I love it. And you have a lot of interesting topics there with, um, the DEI initiatives, which I think are great. And as you mentioned, something that, you know, it's important to implement, uh, in the beginning stages or just yeah. to, to have as early as possible. Um, I was talking with a client reminded me of, um, uh, a client that I spoke with that initiated different uh, DEI groups also at the company in which she works and um, a former company in which she works, um, you know, they didn't really have any for, you know, system set up for uh, mothers on uh, leave, you know, after having a child. And it's one of those things where she, you know, she was like, Hey, I'm the one that's always going to say something. And I spoke up and I, you know, maybe everyone didn't like what I had to say, but it made impacts. <laughs> you, you know, what? It, it's interesting that you, that that's the example that you brought up because literally in January of 2020, so like two ish months before the world closed for the pandemic, we had a uh, parents and caregivers group uh, oh, fill nice. out the, for the Google form to, to be recognized as NRG and they got approved and they had just, they were in their infancy when the pandemic hit and they were such a reliable source of what do you need? How can we help you? Because kids were home, parents were forced to work from home. They didn't know what to do with kids. If they had older kids, it was kind of okay. But you know, the average yeah. age is indeed while I was there was 32, 33. So a lot of smaller children and, I, you know, I remember with, with the, the original kind of like leader of the group, I'm like, I was on a call with her. It was probably like mid-March, end of March of 2020, because we closed in early March of 2020. Just send me a list. Just send me a list. I do not know where I can find money. I will do my best. I can't do everything, but can you just, and like, if you could prioritize it with your group, that'd be great. But it was such a, so helpful. And it was like, a lot of it was getting leaders just to understand that. And this kind of comes to the premise of my book, human beings first, we're all human beings first. That is a universal truth. And even though, you know, two people may look the same, one may have a toddler at home and they're forced to work from home during a pandemic and they're dealing with that. And the other one may be single and like at home, but they feel that they're secluded because they can't get out and their only connection with people is through zoom or FaceTime or whatever the case may be. And so, you know, that's where everything starts to get different. And so it was such a great, the, the, I can't say enough how much our IRGs, just ma the, the leaders matured over time and were so helpful. And you, you're you're also uh, kind of right in that you've got to build a support system for those IRG leaders too, yeah. to really unearth what what potential, you know, they can get out of, the, out of their populations or communities they're building. And those more voices around the table when you're trying to make a decision, not take the pandemic out of it. When you're trying to make any decision, the better. The the perspectives, and I, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say like, oh, it's about diversity, inclusion, blogging. It is, but like diversity of perspective is so important. I was yeah. talking with a client this morning about how, you know, the more voices you bring into this conversation, the better solution that you're going to get out of it because you don't know what you don't know. And if you have never experienced it and somebody else has those lived experiences or, you know, sitting in a role today and, you know, my leader leaves and it's like, oh, my God, what about this? And like, oh, we didn't think about that. That's a great thing to add to the transition list. It's just, you know, nobody has all the answers. I think that's the fundamental truth as well. Yeah. Like no one has all the answers. So the more people you can enlist to, to hopefully get closest to the best answer, the better. That's so true. And like you said, like diversity of it's great to have diversity of all sorts and diversity of opinion as well. I mean, I could yeah. be in a group with five other black females around my same it, age it, and we yes. have totally different views. You, you all, and that's <laughs> it. We all have different lived experiences and you yes. don't know until you start to, you know, I, I think of us as, as, as a book and we're all, you don't understand, you don't know it till you start to look at the table of contents and read some of the chapters in the book to know what someone's lived experience really was. Yeah. And I think sharing and, and vulnerability and connecting with people through storytelling is so important. That is very true. So I, I love that you hit that point. I could go on and on. I, I'm sorry. I, I, want, yeah. I want to stay on topic. Uh, no, 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 no. You're fine. I, <laughs> I saved here. I'm like, oh my God, we could talk about a million things, but I don't want to 
Uh, you know, stretch it too long, but um, I, I, these are great topics. So you were mentioning too with Indeed that um, roles went from 20, 12,000, I think, to 35 or 40,000. Yeah. So we grew our population from 1,000 to 12,000, but during oh, that period one of time, because of attrition, we hired like 35 oh, to 40,000 wow. people. And if you think of the, the, the top end of that funnel, so people apply. And so, you know, we had this one to 10 rule where we'd start to look at 10 candidates at the top end of the funnel to yes. get down to one final candidate. So if you use the one to 10 math, we talked to 350 to 400,000 candidates. Wow. At That's a lot. And so lot. what what type of role, I'm sure there were so many, but what are some of the types of roles that? Um, a, a little bit of everything. So like account executive, inside sales, customer service roles, certainly HR, HR business partner, recruiter, you know, recruiting leaders, um, learning and development, finance, marketing, um, we had a great uh, group of economists um, that helped oh. us understand, how, help take data that we had and look at what's going on in the economy and the labor market and help our clients understand uh, macroeconomic trends a little bit better and socioeconomic trends, both uh, from a U.S. perspective and a, and a global perspective. So we had a chief economist and a team of economists, which is a little bit unique to a lot of yeah, companies. So. Um, some real estate companies some other recruiting companies have economists, but not everybody has those. Um, certainly engineering, software engineers, engineering leaders, QA, um, product, product development kind of run, ran the, the gamut. We did have, so the economist role is a little bit unique. And we also had another unique role uh, that was called search quality. And that was basically taking a look at jobs that were posted on Indeed and determining that they weren't scams. Um, wow. Okay. So kind of, you know, making sure that the job, our focus was always the job seeker and our clients knew that, but it was clearly the job seeker was our focus and their experience. And so terrible experience for you to look at a job like, oh my God, like this job pays, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year. I'm going to apply. Yeah. And it really is ultimately a scam. And so our search quality team did such an amazing job of keeping you know, nefarious folks and nefarious postings and scam postings off of our site. But that's a job that's a little bit unique that doesn't exist in every Yeah, country. that is very unique. I, I have a, out of curiosity, what would the motive be for people to post like a scam job? You get like, <laughs> you think about all the, all the scams today with like, you know, oh, you're, I just I literally this morning got a text, a text, air quotes, um, <laughs> from the USPS that a, a package that's supposed to be delivered to me is hung up and I need to click on this link. So same type of thing, you know, you would see yeah, where they would true. ask ask for money to apply for the job. I that, see. That, that's oh. not. <laughs> right. certain, certain, there, there are a couple of South American countries where like where, where job seekers pay to apply. Oh, interesting. Okay. But that is not the norm. And so clearly that's a scam and like sort right. of asking for, you know, social security or other kind of personal like financial that, yeah. information and things like that. So this, you know. Sadly, there are bad people out there trying to do bad things every place. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I feel like it's getting worse as time goes on with that. Yeah. And now we have AI. So <laughs> yes, I know. And another topic that I'm definitely going to hit. Um, and for you know, across the diverse roles for which we were hiring, as you mentioned, like software engineers, uh, even economists, uh, everything, account management. What were some of the key attributes that you looked for um, in an applicant? I think for me, um, you know, there's the, there's the them being able to do the functional part of the job, and you know that 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 that's kind of you know, foundational. But it's like, how passionate are they about the organization? How passionate are they about the mission? And you think, you know, sometimes job seekers and companies lose sight of the fact that recruiting is a two way street. It's not just the company interviewing you; it's you interviewing the company. So, is this going to be? Is this a, is this a mission I can get my head wrapped around? Um, is there some social good that this organization is doing? You know, Indeed was in, in business to make money for our shareholder, our, our parent company, but at the end of the day, helping people get jobs and get back to work, there is a social aspect to. Um, yes. You know, my, my biggest, uh, it'd be interesting when I would interview candidates if they weren't direct reports of mine and somebody on my team or another team's like, hey, can you just meet this person? And like, we think they're, we wanna make an offer, but I just want another set of eyes that is kind of really objective, hasn't been in the process. And I was always surprised when I did that because I would, I treat interviews as a conversation. Like I know the things that I want to, somebody will tell me, Hey, can you, you know, talk of, you know, make sure you talk about this, this, and this, or I went into it knowing what I wanted to, how I wanted to weave the conversation. But I was like, let's start a conversation. And usually I would start with candidates. Like, what questions do you have for me? Here's, here's who I am. Here's my role. Here's how long I've been here. Um, you've met with a bunch of people already. What questions do you have for me? And the thing that still strikes me today is how many people that would catch off guard. 
I know. I mean, even me, when you, you mentioned you, it, I right. kind of was like, you've oh, got that's it. <laughs> you have, you've, you've, it, this is as much you, you figuring out if this is the right place for you as it is the company. And so yes. you can, I tell, I tell job seekers all the time, you can have the same question and you can ask six people the same question and compare their answers. You know, a good one for that is, can you t- in a few words, describe what the company culture is like? It's good to, I did that when I was interviewing at Indeed, I met with, uh, I had a lot of interviews, Um, but I met like all 12 members of the senior team that were my peers when I got the job. And I asked them all that question and I wrote down, you know, and I I tried to keep it to a couple of words. It's like, what are the first three or four words that come to mind to describe the company's culture? Hmm. And then I started to look for themes in that. I'm like, all right, like, you know, friendly, collegial, got that. Oh, this is an interesting one, strict. Somebody said strict. And I was right. like, I, oh. when I got there, I'm like, it's the last thing for a second. But only one person said that. So yes. I'm like, all right, that's an anomaly. You kind of have to look for patterns and themes. But it's still interesting to me. I mean, that's a simple one. You know, what does success in this role look like in six or 12 months is a good hiring manager question. Hmm. So you yeah. know, as the, as the job seeker, what the expectations are, what they've already started to think about. And you can either, you know, if you think some of those are, too crazy, you can you, you can work them out or have those conversations, or you may want to add others to that. Um, you know, asking if you're interviewing, if it's a good interview process and you get to interview some peers, you know, what's the leader like? What's their leadership style? Um, yes. you know, how do they handle one-on-ones and feedback? And I think it's important for job seekers to come with these questions and with this curiosity about an organization. It is interesting when I would ask that question, the ones that I, you, you can tell when they're caught off guard, they would. I'm going to come, you know, give me a second. I'm going to come up with something. And they, yeah. they, they ask question. The ones that's, that still stymied me to this day, is like, no, I don't have anything for you. What do you have for me? And I'm like, this oh. is an opportunity. <laughs> this is another opportunity to get a couple more data points to exactly. really make a decision that's going to be good for you. Because like, you know, like there's the, uh, somebody gave me advice a long, long time ago that I've I've tried to use in my career. There was one time, one job change that I didn't use it and I use it as a learning experience today, but you don't want to be running from something. You want to be running to something. Oh, I and like in order to run to yeah. something, I need to, I need to, I, I want to be curious. I want to learn about it. I want to learn about the people and the company and the mission, their business model and things like that versus I can't say my job. I can't say my boss. I just right. need something. And I, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen because people have bills to pay. There's rent, sure. there's mortgages, there's you know gas in the car and all that stuff. So I understand that. So there's times where you just have to do that to take a job because you need to keep the lights on, proverbially, like keep, keep the lights yeah. on. <laughs> but if you're not in that situation, like really do your diligence. And the other advice I will give to your job, uh, yes. your, folks, your viewers is, I was the head of HR for Match.com, as you mentioned, and the head of HR for uh, Indeed. Dating and recruiting are very similar processes. Mm-hmm. You just want a different relationship at the end of the process. But if you get flags, yellow, orange, red, whatever color you want to uh, uh, assign to them during the interview process, you can only assume that those behaviors are going to get worse when everybody that's gets true. more comfortable with each other. Cause that's what's happened. First date, I'm going to press my shirt. I'm going to shave. I, you know, I try not to look too tired. Maybe I'll put some, you know, um, cover up under my, <laughs> my my dark circles. Like, all right, let's go. By the six month mark, it's like, all right, my shirt looks good. You know, it hung in the shower while I was taking a shower. It's got a little steam. All right, you know, I got a little stubble, but it's all right. By the the year, it's like, all right, this is me. You know, right. and this is the same thing that happens when you get with a hiring manager and a company and a team. And so, if there's a flag that concerns you. You really need to like dig into it and either get comfortable that it's something that can be dealt with, or maybe this isn't the right place for you. But I see a lot of a lot of job seekers become enamored, like, oh my God, the company's great. They have great benefits. Mm. And then they start to pick up these little subtle like concerns in the process and they kind of just sweep them under the carpet. And then six or nine or 12 months later, it's like, oh no, they're worse now. It's like yeah. what I, you know, what I was dreading. And so like really, really do your diligence. That is my number one thing for candidates. And those that, those are the ones that impressed me is that, you know, I had one candidate who was interviewing for a receptionist role in New York, which is the office I was based in. And she literally had a spreadsheet when she came into the oh, interview. Oh, wow. And she's like, I've like taken these notes and I've ranked things. And so I just want to get, I'm going to ask you to rank a few things. And like, she had her own little like survey. She was saying like, she ultimately <laughs> got the job, but I'm like, this is great. Yeah. Like this is the power is in your hands. Like job seekers have power. That's true. I love that you say that because job seekers do. And and also, 
as you mentioned with that uh, lady, I'll just call her a young lady, I don't know her age, that came in um, with her spreadsheet. And that, that shows also self-awareness and um, which is such a great thing. And I understand that everyone doesn't always have that and especially the younger person is, but it's a powerful thing um, and able to, uh, as you mentioned, just get as much information as possible and discern you know, the company indeed's great, <laughs> but also is it a great match for me? That exactly. Applicants? Is this right. the right place for me right like right now in my career? Because it's not exactly. always right. Like and it, the other thing I would say to our employees and um our SVP of engineering at the time hated it when I would say this in, in all company meetings. And like, you know, I would kind of like say, I know you're not all going to be here forever. And like on average, people stay two to three years. I think yeah. that, that average is still holds true to this day. If I can keep you here four or five or six years, and when you leave, you still have a positive uh, experience and a, and you're talking positively about the company and your experience at the company, that is icing on the cake for me because you're I, likely connected to somebody or multiple people with the amount of hiring we were doing who are interviewing here that may reach out to you and say, hey, you worked at Indeed, can you give me some insight? Because I do think the best insight comes from people that work there. Yes. That you in, in your That's network, the LinkedIn or whatever network, um, kind of you tap into like, who do I know that works there? Or who do I know that knows someone that works there so I can get some real insight? Absolutely. Totally true. And so, you, you know, you mentioned some of the, of course, thing, good, great advice to job seekers, by the way. And then also, um, I love that you asked that question of what questions you have for me and kind of seeing the response that applicants would give. What kind of things... Uh, uh, even outside of an interview, even in the resume per se, which would be looking at pros and cons, you know, in terms of applicants, any things that stand out either way. Um, I, so I, I may sh say something that could be a little. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll try not to hold it against. You. <laughs> um, I'm not a big believer in job descriptions and resumes, and oh. I'm gonna. I'll explain why. <laughs> I don't think hiring managers spend any amount of time with with job descriptions. If you read, and, and yeah. also they're the least exciting document. It's a Word doc with a paragraph, a couple bullets, another paragraph, and a couple bullets, and like an equal opportunity employment statement at the bottom of it. Yeah, it's not very dynamic. It's not fun and interesting. Um, and I find that it's a lot of past behavior, and past behavior doesn't dictate future. Uh, behavior or performance. We did have, we were had, we had this really difficult role in our um, information technology group, um, which is a, a support group. And I remember the hiring manager did a video versus a job description. Like, oh. This is what I'm looking for. This is what success looks like. Here's what I'm like as a leader. That got a lot of really good traction. So yeah. it's still in a sense, a job description. It's not a boring word document. Um, right. I think resumes, are fine. They're they're they tell sure. a story of past performance in different cultures and different company cultures. And I also find that you become products of your culture. If your culture is a certain way and you like it there and you want to stay there, you conform to those boundaries that that culture has created. And they, my company may not be the same culture, and so I think that's hard. I think I see a lot of like you know four and five page resumes. If you think about it from a recruiter's perspective, <laughs> yeah. even with AI and applicant tracking systems, like doing, you know, parsing and looking for keywords and things like that, it's a, your, your resume is a short, quick snippet of your past experience and your general, you know, if you do a, a paragraph talking about you in general, but it is something that catches the eye of a recruiter that makes them look a little bit more deeply into that resume, your LinkedIn profile. They may look at social media, trying to get a sense totally. of who you are, and that's likely going to get you a phone call and at least a phone screen. Yeah. So don't get mired down in lots of words, bullets, like be succinct, be clear where you can use data. Data is your friend. You know, sales is the easiest one to, to, to give an example. But like, you know, when I came in, my book of business was supporting at performing at 103%. In my first year, it was performing at 140%. So a 37% right. increase, which drives revenue for the company. Like, you know, where you can do that. Recruiting, there are metrics around that, even from if you're applying for an HR business partner role. And those are hard because there aren't it's not a lot of hard, fast data. You're dealing with employee issues typically. 
and projects and programs, but you can talk about programs and projects that you helped your clients like roll out with your clients, the, the groups that you support and the impact that that has. There still can be some subjective, but it's, I think it's being, you know, it's be brief and be succinct um, are the two important things. And so, you know, you don't need to talk about, like I, for a long time, I had like my couple handful of original jobs at American Express was the first, my first like corporate yeah. job. Um, and I'm like, okay, like, you know, it's on my LinkedIn profile. It doesn't need to be on my resume because nobody cares that I was a manager of the telephone service center in 19, whatever, <laughs> 90 yeah. something. Um, when I'm, you know, interviewing for a CHRO job, like they really don't. And if they do, they can go find it on LinkedIn. So it's like, right. it's really, it, it, you need to think of it as your, as your, you know, kind of expanded calling card. Like, yes. who are you? What have you done? And why should I pick up the phone and call you to have a conversation about job X? So true. I, and I and I agree. And no, you did not offend me by <laughs> that's good <laughs> by mentioning. And I do feel actually when you mentioned the the hiring manager that did that video, I found that very fascinating and I'm sure like compelling. And e- even though I'm a resume writer and it is a traditional type of uh, uh, industry. I, I, I'm all about uh, innovation. You, you may not be into astrology, but I'm an Aquarius. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm all, yeah, I'm all about like innovation and progress and moving forward in the future. And uh, I think it will be fascinating to see how things change. Uh, and it may be very interesting in the future, like you're the hiring manager that you mentioned for job seekers to do something like that as well. Yeah. I mean, I think everything's fair game. Recruiters are looking, you know, they're going to spend, and there's lots of studies, um, you know, 30, 60, 90 seconds scanning a resume. Um, What pops out, that's why I say be be brief and be be succinct. And how do you stand out? Because, you know, when I started looking for jobs, it was a paper resume in the mail, snail mail. You were responding to a, a, a newspaper ad. Oddly, my first internet company was a, blind ad in the Los Angeles times that I responded to via snail mail. Uh, That's a story for another conversation, but it's still the same thing. They're not, maybe it's it's on a screen, but I'm scanning and I've got, especially in the market today, so many people, especially in the tech space have been impacted by layoffs and reductions in force. There is a very large market of talent out there looking for a finite, you know, set of jobs or looking, looking to, to get a finite set of jobs. And how do I stand out? Um, something that catches my eye, something that's unique about you, a skill that you bring, a you know, a connection. So I, I do think that is important. So true. And and, and I, I one of the things too that you mentioned that um, I agree with wholeheartedly is keeping things more succinct. You mentioned also like when you worked at I think you said American Express that it may not be relevant to future. It's also that targeting, you know, yes. um, uh, including what's important, you know, throwing out what's not in a way. Um, sifting through what's not, I should say. And, um, you know, when you mentioned something about a four to five page resume, yes, way too long. <laughs> if it's not an I, academic CV or something like that. It exactly. Not be. I, I've recently right. seen a four page resume. And I'm yes. Like, and the person is younger than me. Oh, wow. I mean, and don't get me wrong. We, we can all do a lot of things, but it, yes, you it's gotta... a, this is, it's a calling card. Like this <laughs> is an opportunity to sell. And then, and then you get the interview and then you sell, you can tell them everything. Yes. 100%. So I agree because there are many executives I worked with that don't have anywhere near that long. Of, I mean, you can, but you still have yes, to sift, like you said, yeah. to, to produce the, the calling card that's the most effective. Awesome. And switching gears just to, uh, for a minute, I'm really curious. Tell me more about your fir- human first leadership books. What uh, book, what topics do you dive into and what is human first leadership? Yep. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. So the the book's titled "Human Human Beings First: Practices for Empathetic and Expressive Leadership." So it's focused at leaders, but honestly, anybody, any human being, could read the book and take something away and make a relationship better, um, or create a new relationship with somebody. And so it it gets into, you know, the the first thing is is we're all human beings first. That's the that's the the one universal truth that that I talk about. Leaders are humans as well. And so it doesn't mean that I show up as an imposter as your leader where everything's good and I have every answer and I control everything. And like, you know, I've got nothing. I don't I don't have a daughter that's, you know, about to go to college or my dog isn't sick or, you know, my great grandmother's dying or whatever the case may be. Like we all have stuff going on. 
Um, and we need to be respectful of that. And I think the more that you're comfortable sharing, and it's up to a leader to create psychological safety, but they can do that by kind of you know uh, portraying these behaviors. And so making sure that you share uh, with your team and that you connect with your team, either a new connection or a deeper connection with somebody you already have. Storytelling is a very good and kind of sharing a past experience. I talked about lived experiences earlier, protecting yeah. your team, helping your team, seeing your team, um, hearing things, hearing everything, even some of the things you don't wanna hear to try and make things better is what I talk about. So it is targeted at leaders, but I think if any human being read the book and thought about a a, a challenge they were having in a relationship or you know somebody who, and I, I, I don't use this example in the book, but we have a, a set of friends that we've become very good friends with over the last six or seven years. Um, they have very different political views than my husband and I, sure. which is fine. Like I... For me in the U.S., I'm a registered Democrat. I vote yeah. for who I believe is going to be best at that moment in time in whatever role I'm voting for. So I've, oh. I've voted in the presidential races for Democrats and Republicans. Yeah. Um, we're going to have a contentious presidential election coming. Oh, it's oh gosh, started, yes. but Like it'll get worse <laughs> when we turn, turn, turn the calendar over. And so, you know, there was a reaction because we saw something in one of their cars that led us to believe that they were an extreme of the other party. And sure. it just got a little bit weird. And so like, we ended up having this conversation and like, um, yes, we did vote for this person. I'm trying not to use names, but people I understand. Are it. <laughs> we did vote for this person. We clearly will never do that again. And like, let's talk about yeah. like, how we're more fiscally conservative and you may not be in kind of way. And you find when you don't judge and you are curious and ask questions and try and get to understand a little bit better their perspective. It doesn't mean you're, you're going to change your opinion, your perspective, right. but I think recognizing that what makes the world go round is people with a lot of different opinions and perspectives. Um, that's what makes great companies. If you think about like companies like Apple, there are tons of, you know, very diverse people there building these products that a lot of us use all the time and rely on. Like I cannot live without an Apple product these days. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm beholden to Tim Cook and the whole Apple team, Same. but you know, and there are lots of examples like that, but don't just judge. There's a, there's a quote, um, which is be curious, not judgmental, which I love Oh, that's um, a great because quote. it gets at what I'm talking about. And it's attributed to Walt Whitman, but he actually, nobody really knows who said it. It's anonymous, hmm. but I use it a lot. And it's like this example of this political differences. It's like, just ask questions and like, try and understand why they think the way they think. And again, it doesn't mean you have to change your opinion, but you can respect somebody and respect their opinion and still be friends with them. And you may not agree on certain topics. Like not everybody agrees. My husband and I don't agree on everything. Right. I think no, that's the beauty I, of relationships. So um, true. Yeah. So like Very that's the, the the that's the premise of of the book. It's an easy read. It is simple because my focus was people don't have to learn new behaviors or emotions to be better humans. These are all emotions and behaviors we already have within us. We just need to lean into them a little bit more. I really like that. And I, I will plan, and I, I honestly will love to check out your book because um, it sounds very interesting. And I think, as you mentioned, anyone, not just a, a, yeah. a leader per se, you know, we can all lead in different ways, but yeah. take away from that. And I like the uh, kind of story situation you shared with your friends that, you know, have maybe difficult typically difficult a different uh political views but that uh you have a com you know, commonality of coming together i have friends of so many different backgrounds i mean exactly. total you know um for, i have a very broad range of friends on different ends of the spectrum everything from um you know sexuality to politics to you know so it's and i i i'm one of those quirky people that i love probably like you people with differences, uh, being able to talk openly uh, um, and respectfully. And so, and you learn, like you said, you may not change your opinion, but I will say that if I, if I personally have a conversation with someone on the opposite end of the spectrum, be belief wise me, but uh, they're able to have, we're able to have a respectful, open conversation. And I'm able to ask, well, you know, why do you believe that? Or, you know, I, I me personally, if I am to shift my opinion more, it's because it, I was able yes. to have an open, respectful 
dialogue. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, honestly, like I would, somebody suggested I do this, but I'm not going to do it. I will say it here. Um, <laughs> every politician should read my book because yeah. In the U.S., politics have become so polarized and it's us against them. And like the end yeah. of the day, we're all Americans, we're all human beings. We should all just want what's best for this country. Um, yeah. So that's that's my that'll be my political statement. for this. I country. agree. I, and I love that. I, I support you. I support you. <laughs> all Wolf 2024. <laughs> uh, no, no. Read the book. <laughs> I'm happy to send any politician my book. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want nothing to do with politics. I know. <laughs> well, I support that. Everyone should read, definitely read the book. But I'm curious, what what is your feeling generally on AI? I think we need to embrace it. I think, sadly, like deep fakes and videos have been oh, around gosh. for years yeah. now. And they're, that's the bad side of AI. And like, you know, with anything, I think we've got to try and embrace it for the good, try and put some boundaries and barriers up for the bad, but really think about how it can help make our lives better. Because that's post-pandemic for me as a as a human first leadership advocate and even just an HR thought leader, it's how can companies make the lives of their employees better? Mm. Because at the end of the day, it's all life. There's no more work in life. It's life and work is a mm. category within the broad spectrum of life, just like my dogs, my husband, my family, my hobbies, whatever else, you know, whatever other categories you have, children, um, and work is just a part of it. And so how do we, how, how, how do we embrace it to help make our lives better is how I'd like to think everyone to think about it. I love that. Uh, that's, I, I truly do. And so, you know, you, you have such a well-rounded background in HR, and I feel a unique, val valuable contribution of human first leadership, kind of stressing empathy and leadership. Um, you mentioned some advice earlier for job seekers. I'm curious if you have any more advice that you give to job seekers um, and to employers or organizational leaders. Yeah, I think for job seekers, uh, I was talking to one the other day who left their job because they realized that I needed to focus full time on my, my, my job search and financially this person could do that. So that's great. There are a lot of people out there that have been impacted by reduction in the forest and layoffs. Um, I see it, still see them on LinkedIn, you know, posting more and more on LinkedIn. I do see people getting jobs that have been impacted kind of earlier in the year, which makes me feel good for the folks that have been impacted and are looking now, your full-time job is looking for a job. I find so many, so many job seekers I would talk to when I was at Indeed and other places that they got impacted, uh, you know, they lost their job, whatever the reason for it was. And they, well, like I sent some resumes on a Monday, but I haven't heard anything back. Like, no, your eight hour day needs to be built around your job search. So, you know, if you're not a, for interviews, if you're not a morning person, I would not do an interview before 10 or 11 o'clock my time <laughs> if I had that available, you know, that, 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 that luxury. Sure. Like my mornings would be like, okay, I need to research companies and missions and and what am I interested in and what role do I want to do? And like, all right, I've got that. Then maybe the after early afternoon was done. You know, if I could schedule interviews during that time, that's when I'm at my peak. I, the afternoon slump, the, the sugar low hasn't hit or anything like that. And then maybe later in the day, it's doing follow-ups um, or applying for new jobs. But your schedule then becomes your eight-hour schedule then becomes or your day. I don't want to use eight hours anymore because it is what you yeah. want. But your 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 work each day or that week is really finding a job. And that's what you need to devote yourself to. Um, I think also remember as you're interviewing, it's as much your research going on as it is the company's research going. Ask questions, do your diligence before you say yes. Because once you say yes, you're there and you got to stick it out for a little bit unless you just, you know, don't and then you got to do the whole search all over again. So like that's that. I think for employers and for hiring managers, be as transparent as possible. Like I always, I always say to candidates, candidates would make a comment to me like, wow, that you've shared a ton of information with me. And I, I always say like, I don't want to run into you on Zoom in 60 days or in a hallway of an office in 60 days. And you to and me to say, hey, oh, hey, so-and-so, how's it going? You, you to look at me and it's like, you didn't tell me any of this. <laughs> right. I, I want to try and tell you everything. I'll tell you the good, the bad, the ugly, because no company is perfect. There are good days and there yeah. are bad days and the good out, has to outweigh the bad. That's always been my formula. But I think transparency is really a key here. It's like, give them a real glimpse of what it's like. I remember my first job at American Express, and I still remember this. This is a long, long time ago. I was applying to be a call center rep for their platinum card products, so customer service for platinum card. And I hadn't worked in a call center before. 
and went through the interview process. And I think they narrowed it down to like, here are people that we're interested in. And then they invited us all for like an hour and a half session to sit with a call center rep and listen and see what that hour and a half of their day was like. That was oh, so wow. lightning to me. I'm like, okay, God, like, I don't know how long I do this, but I think this company is great and their benefits are great. I'm going to do my best. And so I was on the phone for 18 months and then applied for a job and got another job, but like it was my foot in the door, but at least I knew what I was getting into. I was talking, another example I'll give you about transparency is I was talking to a client when I was at Indeed and um, food packaging, food, food production, frozen food production. And they said, we have this challenging job that works in our freezers. It is Oh, below wow. freezing, it is cold. And we have a lot of people that apply and we hire and they sign an offer letter and then they don't show up or they don't come back after the second or third day. And so like we were having lunch and I said, here's a random thought. Like, do you do the interview in the freezer? Mm. Because if you, you know, somebody says right. to you, 32 degrees for eight hours. Like, ah, I can, you know, I can, I can, I can do it. I can, I heavy cobo. <laughs> like it's another thing to like be in it. And he kind of looked at me and he's like, no, why? And I'm like, but you don't know what it's going to be like. Exactly. So like, I, you can't, you know, you're not going to spend eight hours with them in there, but like have them do a couple interviews in I there. Know. And it, spend some time. Maybe like, he's like, that's really interesting. Now I, I never followed up to see if that Change sure. like, that's a that's it, a good idea. I think transparency gives people a little taste of what it's going to be like to work here, and that is going to help me with my decision making process. So I think transparency in the candidate experience, you've got to re respect the candidate. The candidate has either taken time off of work, called in sick. We've all done it when you're interviewing. Yeah. Um, like show up on time, be prepared. A, the worst example of a hiring manager to me of being disrespectful to a candidate is. You walk into an interview late mm. and, oh, I haven't looked at your resume. Give me a few minutes to review. Your resume. <laughs> that just means that candidate and that job that they're hiring for is not important. As yeah. a candidate, you're like, I'm scratching you off my list. So like, treat them like you would want to be treated. That's great advice. That's great advice. And and uh, it's interesting because when you're talking about the freezer and the idea of the interview, I was thinking to myself, yeah, probably like a minute into the interview, I'd be like, I'm good. <laughs> That would be me. I grew up in Miami, so that definitely would be me. Oh, you said you grew up in my, oh, that's right, in Miami, where yeah. I am. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. And now, like, after living in California and Miami, after having grown up in the Midwest, my I'm to, I'm a total wuss. My blood has thinned out. <laughs> my This is my least favorite time in New York, in the Northeast. Yeah, part. I know. Yeah. Well, come on down to Miami. You're always, you're always welcome. Um, so, Thank yes, you. how can people, it's been great interviewing you today, by the way, and I want to want people to know how they can keep in touch with you and stay up to date with all the awesome things you have going on in projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Paul E. Wolf on LinkedIn. Follow me. Uh, Paul Wolf, W-O-L-F-E.com is my website. Um, you can buy my book there. You can buy my book on Amazon or any other online retailer. And I'd like to say everyone should definitely check out his podcast, 52 Humans. I've watched a few yes. episodes. Love it. Truly, Thank you. Truly it is, we've been podcast. on a little. We've been on a little hiatus. Um, we've got some new episodes coming out starting next week, and then okay. in the new year, we're going to change our format a little bit to be a little bit lower, longer form. But sure. fifty two has been. It's been. It's great talking to people, just like yes. talking to you today, Leslie. I know it's been an absolute pleasure. I think you've. Um, I've had a just complete joy ride talking with you, and you've offered wonderful advice for both job seekers and hiring managers and and leaders. So. Thanks again to you and thank you everyone for tuning in and stay tuned for the next episode of Ask the Hiring Manager. Thanks. Welcome to Ask the Hiring Manager. I'm Leslie Hunter, president of Resume Makeover. I've been helping job seekers for nearly a decade to acquire their dream jobs and achieve the income they desire. From entry-level applicants to C-suite executives and everyone in between. From your resume to your cover letter, LinkedIn profile, bio, or website content, I'm here for you. And now I'm going to open the door and interview some of the top hiring managers so that you can have the insight that you need to book the jobs that you want. Welcome to Ask the Hiring Manager.